Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my epic rant on the 1994 flop North. And I call it a flop and not just a comedy or a kid's film or an adventure movie because that's exactly what this film is. It's a flop in every capacity. I mean, the film was a critical and financial failure when it came out in 1994. It's infamous for how bad it is. I mean, it's a movie that was so terrible that Roger Ebert's review of the film has its own place in infamy. And after finally seeing the movie, I gotta agree with Roger Ebert and all the other critics. I hated, hated, hated it. I hated North. This film was miserable. Rob Reiner should have called this Misery 2 because it was that miserable of a film to sit through. I do not understand why this film was made. I don't understand why this movie got $40 million for a budget because none of it is on the screen. I don't understand why so many talented people were involved with this piece of shit. I don't get it. Did they owe something to the mob? Why the fuck were so many people that had so much talent so involved with such a disaster? The film is directed by Rob Reiner, who prior to this, he did Misery. He did Misery. He did a lot of other classic, really popular films, movies that featured some great dynamic direction and really showcased his talents as a director, especially when it comes to the comedy and the wit. And his his personality seemed to come through in, in his in his films with the direction. You know, it, it, they were films that definitely had a very witty uh, and, and wonderful tone to them. North is not one of those films. North is trying to be a whimsical, dreamlike adventure. And it at times comes across more like a nightmare comes across more like something that you would not want to continue uh, having if it was a dream. Like you're, you're like, I don't want to keep dreaming this. Can I, can I dream about something else? And for a comedy director, like nothing about the jokes here in land, nothing about the, the humor actually, uh, elicits any kind of smirk or chuckle uh, for a film that's supposed to be for kids. It has some really inappropriate adult humor and some really mean-spirited stuff, like insults about how a certain how some guy's wife is barren, uh, multiple uh, jokes about some boy's ass crack, and a lot of other stuff that's just like. What the hell were they thinking? And Rob Reiner couldn't save any of this. I mean, it looked cheap. It looked lazy. It looked like a film that nobody wanted to really make. It looked like a movie where there wasn't any passion at any point throughout it. Like, it was just nothing but apathy. And and people were just showing up for a paycheck. Um, it just has that whole vibe of a bad film, a movie that was just a misguided production from the very moment it started filming or it started pre-production and it just continued to snowball throughout the production of the film. Rob Reiner was never able to escape the avalanche of awful that was coming towards him. And I, I don't know wh why he continues to defend this film. There's nothing to defend, Rob. There are other films you've done in your career, I get it, but not North. There's nothing to defend when it comes to this movie. The screenplay is by Alan Swibel and Andrew Scheinman, and this is loosely based on the short story by Alan Swibel, who also uh, helped write the screenplay with another writer. This is something, like I said... At the beginning of, of this review, I, I think anyway. If I didn't, I'll just repeat it uh, off the top of my head. This is a concept that works for a short story or a storybook for kids. It does not work for a feature film. There's not enough there. 
There's not enough there with the narrative. There's not enough there in terms of the characters to make them strong enough or likable enough or engaging. The plot itself is not interesting enough. Some kid who becomes a free agent and breaks away from his parents and then goes to multiple places across the world trying to find new parents. Uh, to me, a much better version of this is a segment in the 80s Twilight Zone called The Children's Zoo. And that's about this girl who goes to this children's zoo. And the twist is that the zoo is full of these parents. And it, it seems like these parents were put in this zoo because they were bad parents. And they they were put there so they could learn a lesson. And kids go to the zoo and then choose new parents. Something like that. Because they take their parents who are just totally uh, despicable and don't care for them and aren't good parents. And they get replaced. Uh, their spot gets replaced by other people that are in the zoo. So you'll have like the parents go in the zoo. They get locked up. And then someone else gets let out because they've learned their lesson. Like that worked better for me. And that was like a very short segment than anything in North. For one, the little girl in that segment was more likable than North. North is written in a way where he seems like he's the perfect superstar child. Like he's the guy who's just straight A's, awesome, and then he starts having some issues uh, and he starts slipping in his grades and with his sports because of the fact that he's not really liking what's going on with his parents his parents are ignoring him and he's not having a good connection with them and that leads to him failing in other areas of his life and if you showed more about this character than him just being great and wonderful then this would be something that you could sympathize with but that's not the case he just comes across as an obnoxiously great super kid you know that kind of thing and that's just not very relatable and the parents also are written in ways where they are super awful like they are super bad parents like they ignore him the first time you see him and his parents is they are getting into an argument at the dinner table and north is feigning a heart attack and the parents aren't really phased in any capacity, it seems like they're just so laser focused on their argument that they don't care that their kid is suffering. And there aren't any moments where you see these parents in any other light. So when the film has its eventual twist where he goes back to his old parents because he loves them and he sees a lot of hope in them and he buys into their apology, it's one of those things where it doesn't feel earned because you're like, well, you didn't see anything with these parents where it seemed like they were good parents, but they got misguided and they just uh, had some bad times at their jobs and it, it led to them not uh, focusing on their kid and it led, led to them ne neglecting their son. And, and there really aren't any moments like that. And that's like a textbook example of how to do this kind of plot the right way you provide a character in this kid who's likable who isn't just super kid you have parents that are flawed but still have moments where they seem like they genuinely love their kids like for instance look at home alone look at kevin's parents there are some moments where they seem like they're a little harsh but there's other moments prior to kevin asking for his family to disappear where they seem like they genuinely loved and they cared for him. This is just textbook stuff. And I don't know why it's not there in this script. And it just leads to you just not being engaged in anything. It doesn't help either that it's obviously a dream. And knowing that it's a dream, it just makes other aspects of the plot even more puzzling. Like, why do we have this whole subplot about this kid named I think Richie I think that's who it is no Winchell sorry some other maybe I got him confused with Richie Rich 
uh, this kid named Winchell, who North knows from school. And there's this whole subplot about Winchell rising to power and fame and fortune and using North's lawyer and trying to set him up to be the next president. And there's this whole subplot about corruption and how Winchell has essentially become a supervillain. And there are scenes where North isn't even in the sequence. And this is supposed to be a dream. I don't know about you. I don't know of many dreams that I've had where I'm not in the dream. Where there are long chunks of the dream where I'm not in the dream and it's about completely different people and I'm not involved in those scenes at all. So that's the problem when you structure a script around a dream. You're limited and your limitations also become more obvious and more glaring when you decide to go outside them. And if the film was actually good then I could probably give it more of a pass but it's not so it's a glaring flaw and you have these scenes with Bruce Willis's character where he just shows up randomly uh, throughout the film playing different characters and that also kind of take kind of takes you out of it as well because okay you then start to just focus more on this character and wondering why he keeps showing up over and over again. I guess he's there to provide some advice, but it doesn't seem like his advice is really that that great. And most of the time, the advice is just the same. So there, so there's not a lot of variety when it comes to the advice. The advice is just basically different variations of the same advice. And... North's journey when it comes to him finding new parents is so fucking cringe. The stuff with the Texas parents is just Texas stereotypes to 11. Oh, they drive in a big long limousine because everything's bigger in Texas. Their previous son was was so fat. He was the fattest kid in Texas. And they want North because they want to make him the fattest, next fattest kid in Texas. Because everything's bigger in Texas, get it? Oh, the plates of food, they are sky high because it's Texas. And I'm just like, you know, there's more to Texas than just everything is bigger in Texas. I, I just think it's a pretty lame joke to keep repeating over and over again it's not really that funny and it's a joke that you just completely beat into the fucking ground because of how repetitive it is the entire scene is just everything's bigger in texas i guess everything is 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 a, a bigger failure in texas too but north was a pretty big failure probably a giant failure in the state of texas as well and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of Texans who are probably like, what is this shit? Like, are, are we, we are not past this yet. It's 1994. Can we stop with the Texas stereotypes? And I mean, speaking of stereotypes, like this, this script is so loaded with numerous, just really bad stereotypes to the point where it's kind of legitimately racist at times. And on top of that, it's the kind of thing that legitimately could get canceled in 1994 and definitely would get canceled now. Like this was offensive even in 1994 and it's like doubly so now. And it's not funny either. It's just mean. Like the stuff in Hawaii when North goes to Hawaii and you have Mr. and Mrs. Ho and there's this whole bit where Mr. Ho's talking about how his wife is is the most barren thing on the island. Like, what the hell? And then the repeated jokes about North's ass crack. Like, what is this? Repeated jokes about a boy's ass crack? Like, this is just fucking wrong and not funny. And then there was a whole bit about uh, how Hawaiians, uh, they have it easy in school because they don't use that many words in the alphabet. And I'm like, that's just insulting and not funny. That's just mean. And I was born in Hawaii. So I'm like, that. you're talking about technically my homeland. I'm like, that is just low. 
You put the low in Aloha. And yeah, that whole scene, I don't really get it. I don't it, I don't know why it was so mean and nasty towards Hawaiians. Uh, it sounded like the writers had some bone to pick with Hawaiians for some reason. And then after that scene, they go to Alaska. And for some reason, everything in Alaska is like it's the frozen tundra everywhere with Eskimos and they live in an igloo and they have a, a garage door that's made out of ice and they ice fish in their living room. It just so chock full of cliches and just nonsense about Alaska. And I get, I get it. It's supposed to be a cartoon. It's a, it's a kid's dream, but it still comes across so lazy and, and just not creative and, and not that imaginative. The closest it gets to imagination is sending old people out on ice flows to die because it's a part of their tradition and the ice flows have like TVs and and lazy boys on them and you've got Richard Belzer who plays this guy who I guess is tasked with collecting numbers to get all these old people onto these flows all right come on let's let's get flowing it's just like, what and then after those three just really disastrous trips that North has, uh, of course, every now and then the script will cut to Winchell and the lawyer played by John Lovitz and their rise to power and Viva El Norte and the revolution and I don't give a fuck. I don't care. And you'll also have stuff with North's parents well, they'll give updates on them because as soon as they found out that North was going to be a free agent, they fainted. And there's this repeated gag where they are just in an extended coma. And I guess it's hilarious because they're in a coma. I'm sorry, people in a coma is not funny to me. Uh, and then because the film needs to speed things along, North then goes on a speed run where he goes on a plane because he's running out of time because he has to find new parents at a certain by a certain deadline otherwise he's going to be an orphan. So he gets on the plane and I like to call this the the stereotype olympics or or the marathon of stereotypes because oh my god like this is just so loaded with stereotypes. He goes to the Amish country and quickly flies away cuz it's boring cuz you know get it Amish uh, then he goes to China and they dress him up like an ancient Chinese emperor and they hand him this book that showcases Chinese haircuts and they're like, give him the emperor. And, you know, it's the one with like the ponytail on the side. I'm like, that is so fucking racist. Like, dear God, that's a, that's a caricature like that. That's 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 such a unbelievably racist thing. And then after that, and it's not funny either. It's just like, that's a lazy joke for one. And it's also really fucking racist. Then after that, it gets even worse because he goes to Africa. And everyone in, in, in Africa, at least from the, the presentation of where he's at, is some typical village in the middle of nowhere and a jungle. And you got all these natives who don't speak English. And the whole gag the whole bit for this entire scene is that north can't pay attention because he's staring at this woman's breasts so there's even a line of dialogue where he's like oh i don't think i'm going to be able to get much homework done here i'm like because i won't be able to focus because because you're staring at breasts they're staring at that. like that's the only thing that africans have to offer is they live in the jungle they don't speak English, and the women walk around topless. Ooh! Like, even in 1994, that was rough. Nowadays, it's like multiple pieces of sandpaper stacked on top of each other. Like, goddamn! Then after that, he goes to France, and the whole joke is that everyone in France loves Jerry Lewis, so every channel is a Jerry Lewis movie. 
Because that isn't a, a joke that's as old as time. And he finally ends his journey with the perfect family. This leave it to beaver type of family. And uh, it seems like everything is wonderful and great. But he doesn't fit in. And he doesn't seem like it's the right place for him. Because he still feels like he should be with his real parents. Which is somewhat understandable. But not in the context of this script. Because there's no reason for you to think that he wouldn't want to be with this great wonderful family you're like why wouldn't he want to be with the nelsons why would he want to go back to his parents all we ever all we ever know of his parents is that they gave birth to him and they argue and yell at each other and don't listen to him like why the hell would i even buy that he would want to go back with his old parents but the whole point of that is because if he doesn't then this apocalyptic uh future of kids and Winchell ruling the world will take root. And if he doesn't go back to his old parents, then everyone's screwed. And I get it. I understand why. But that's the only reason why he goes back to his parents has nothing really to do with him. It has everything to do with everything outside of his story. And... This, the the film predictably ends with it being a dream uh, or, or or but is it you know that kind of thing where it's kind of trying to be like maybe it isn't a dream because he has the coin that had a hole in it that he got in the dream uh sequence with uh the 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 two Texans when uh this uh cowboy shot a hole through it. But it seems like it might be something that he always had because he said, I've always had this for luck. So maybe it's not a dream. Maybe they're not even trying to say that it's a dream, but it just seems like a scene that you didn't even need because it just makes things more confusing. And speaking of like the dream, like it ends in a very dark way. It basically ends with North getting shot. It gets shot by a hitman, which is really dark. And definitely not something that fits the tone of the film. And the and the movie just seems like it just ends. Uh, oh, he gets picked up by... The, he goes back home to his parents. They've been worried sick about him. And they tell him that they love him. And then it's, it's over. And you're like, okay. What did North even learn here? He didn't really learn a whole lot. Didn't seem like he had any moments where he really humbled himself the parents like how am i supposed to believe that they're not just going to go back to arguing at him at the dinner table just a a, a few days later like oh oh he he didn't show up they thought he was missing for barely a day now they're going to change their way of 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 treating north and raising him it's like that's that's a stretch Especially from what I've seen from parents. And speaking of stuff with parents, like, this, even though it's a dream, I mean, the parents just completely gave up way too quickly. When the kids were talking about, oh, I'm going to leave now. Oh, if you don't do what I tell you to, I'm going to go to uh, another parent. I'm going to become a free agent. I'm going to find other parents. I, I, I mean... There wasn't as much of a, a backlash as I think there should have been. And that would have been funnier to me to have seen more parents who would have been like, fine, go. <laughs> think I care? Or or, or the, that it would have been twisted and fucked up, but it would have been funny in that regard to show the different dynamic uh, that would occur if kids were allowed to become free agents. Or you'd have the stuff where the kid would try to be like, Oh, I'm not going to clean my, you know, can't tell me to clean my room. Uh, can't tell me to do chores or I'm going to go to some other parents. I, I think you should have had some parents who would have been like, okay, all right. Uh, how about this? When you start making money, when you start actually providing income to keep a roof over your head and to keep food in your belly then I then I might start listening and might actually buy into your threats 
and actually might think that you have some power here. But you're not. You don't make any money. So you need to listen to me. Otherwise, you can go. You can try to live on your own. Try to find some other parents. But here's the thing. The other parents will tell you the same shit, kid. They will also tell you, you don't make any money. So why should I listen to you? I get it. It's a kid's fantasy. But it just seems like something that when you think about it for like two seconds, it falls apart. Even for a fantasy. Because you're like, there's no way that so many parents would just become slaves to their kids. Just because kids were like, I'm going to leave and go to another parent. Yeah, that doesn't mean that I'm going to do your fucking chores. That doesn't mean I'm going to hand you lemonade and fresh out of the glass whenever you ask for it. Doesn't mean I'm going to spoil you because I still make the money. I'm still the one that pays the bills. I'm still the one that keeps the roof over your head. I'm still the one that pays for your food and pays for that lemonade. But, you know, that's that's overthinking things. I get it. But that's what happens when you watch films like this that are so boring and so nonsensical and so unfunny and so unlikable that you just start thinking about other things. You think about other things so you can keep yourself occupied because the film definitely isn't doing that. And then you have the cast. I mean, God damn, this cast is great. You got a young Elijah Wood who had already shown that he was a talented actor, talented young actor in films like The Good Son. You got Bruce Willis who plays the narrator and these advisors that show up throughout the film and give North advice. You've got John Lovitz, you've got Jason Alexander, you've got Julia Louis Dreyfus, you've got Alan Arkin, you've got Dan Aykroyd, you've got Reba McIntyre. Alexander Gudinov, Kelly McGillis, Graham Greene, Kathy Bates, Abe Vigoda, Faith Ford, John Ritter, Scarlett Johansson, and I think her first role, Ben Stein, uh, Jesse Smollett is in this apparently, uh, Rosalind Chow, Keon Young, Lauren Tom. So, a good cast. And Elijah Wood, I'm not going to be too hard on him because the character of North is a character that, by the way that this character is written, is just unlikable. It's not Elijah Wood's fault. He tries. He tries to make this character endearing, like the, the scene where he's doing Fiddler on the Roof. And there's a few other moments where Elijah Wood just... You can tell he's trying as hard as he can to make this character into someone that the audience likes. But I don't like the character. No matter how hard Elijah tries, at best, I like Elijah. But I don't like North. Bruce Willis, I mean, he's embarrassing himself here. Wearing a pink bunny suit. Like, what? What? Wearing a pink bunny suit and doing all this other shit where it seems like he's just shilling for companies like FedEx, FedEx, like Federal Express. At one point, it was kind of fun to see Bruce Willis play these different roles. Gabby, the tourist, the sleigh driver, Joey Fingers. It's kind of fun to see him do that because he did a lot of that in Moonlighting. But he was definitely a lot more successful when it comes to that in that show than here. And even though he's playing these different roles, it doesn't seem like his heart is in a lot of these different roles. They seem to kind of run together because it seems like he's just going through the motions and just collecting a paycheck and pretty dead eyed and dead inside other than maybe Joey Fingers. Other than that character, like all the other stuff just seemed like Bruce Willis was there because he had was doing a favor for Rob Reiner or some shit. I don't know. I, I and he's just not a good narrator either. It doesn't. I don't understand why Bruce Willis does so much narration. He's not a good narrator. He wasn't a good narrator in uh, Bonfire of the Vanities, and he's not a good narrator here. 
Some actors, they just work as narrators. They have the right personality. They have the right vibe for a narrator. Bruce Willis doesn't have that. He's not the right guy to, to be the narrator, especially a guy who's narrating the life of North. John Lovitz is effectively um, sleazy, plays those roles well, but there wasn't anything that funny about the performance. Matthew McCurley is Winchell, like, ugh. Curly is right. Like, this is the kind of performance that makes you want to curl up in, in a ball and scream because it's just so fucking irritating and annoying. I hated this character. I hated this kid. I wanted to see him dropped out of the high rise that he took over. Uh, Jason Alexander and Julie Louis Dreyfus, I mean, they're playing the parents. They do a good job being mean and nasty and being dismissive of their kid. And they do okay when they have a moment of, of recognition where they're like, oh my God, we were bad parents. We, we want you to come back North, but it, it, there's really not much to say. I will say this when they are in a coma and they're comically knocked out, uh, both of them definitely did commit to that bit. Uh, Alan Arkin fine as the judge, Dan Aykroyd and Reba McIntyre, dear lord. Uh, like the the two of them were just the cringe twins, <laughs> like just so cringe inducing to see their scenes, their their musical number where they're talking about how they're gonna make North fat. Uh Dan Aykroyd, like, god damn man, you deserve better and you've done better. Alexander Gudinov wasted as this Am Amish guy so is kelly mcgillis as his wife graham green and kathy bates like what the fuck like two really great actors and performers just slumming just lowering themselves to this bullshit john ritter as ward nelson it was great casting you want to have the father of like the perfect family john ritter is like the great a uh, guy for that role and John Ritter tries but there's nothing to this character and there's nothing to this role and I just feel bad because I love John Ritter and I miss him so much I just wish he was in a film that wasn't this shitty like John Ritter wasted time being in this shitty film when he could have starred in something better around this time that being said John Ritter was really nice and sweet like John Ritter was like that wasn't an act that was who John Ritter was in real life he definitely is some guy that we we absolutely miss today definitely miss his his humor and and just his love of life and his love of other people and I don't know why North didn't want to be with John Ritter. Like, if I had the choice, I'd be John, I'd go live with John Ritter. Especially if my family was that mean to me. Why the hell would I not choose John Ritter and his family? It's a mystery to me. Uh, Scarlett Johansson, not much to say, because she's just in it for a little bit. It's one of her first roles. Uh, Keon Young and Lauren Tom, I mean, they play uh, a Hawaiian couple that despise Americans for some reason. And also have some pretty uh, weird notions of their own heritage and their own country. Country is not the right word, but their own state. But, I mean, for what they were asked to do, I guess they did all right. But, yeah, a good cast, talented performers. But they just do not work here because the material they're given is so bad it's this film is a prime example of a movie where you can have a great cast with great actors and actresses and you will not always have a great movie and then the cinematography by adam greenberg is just nothing special it's pretty average so is the editing by robert layton now one thing about this film that I legitimately will give some praise to is the score. I thought the score by Mark Scheiman was 
whimsical. It was wonderful. It was fun. It had a nice uh, mix of different uh, um, styles of music from different places all over the globe. And I wish this score was in a better family film. Because this is a good score. Like from the opening credits, you're like, oh, maybe this film isn't that bad. It's got a good score. I like the opening credits with all the toys and everything. It seems like something that might be kind of fun. And then the rest of the movie starts and then everything goes south really quick. I mean, speaking of south, this film should just be called South. Because everything, for the most part, about this movie goes south. It's a movie where pretty much... The majority of it is a spectacular failure in numerous aspects. I mean, the 40 to 50 million dollar budget, where the hell did it go? This does not like this this does not look like a movie that costs that much. See, I'm discombobulated, can barely even speak, because I can't even believe that this movie cost 40 to 50 million dollars. I don't know where it went. Did it go to Bruce Willis and his multiple costumes? Like, where the fuck did this money go? Because it's not on the screen. And at 87 minutes, it feels like 187 minutes. Because you're not invested in the story. You're not invested in the characters. It's not a funny comedy. And it's not a fun adventure. It just drags and drags and drags and drags and drags. That's why I hated, 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 hated it. That's why a lot of audiences hated it too. I mean, twelve. it only made $12 million. It's a huge bomb for the studio. And critics all across the board, for the most part, despise this movie. And rightfully so. It's got the wrong vibe. It's got the wrong tone. At times it's too dark or it's too adult-orientated in terms of its humor. And when it tries to appeal to the kids it completely misses the mark when it tries to appeal to adults it also misses the mark because the humor just comes across as lazy or just mean and it's a film that there's just not enough there you don't care about this journey you don't care about north become a free agent and there's not enough there for a feature film anyway there's there was barely enough there for a short novel for kids and definitely not enough there for a feature film. I don't understand why anyone involved in this movie thought that this was something that should have been made into a 40 to $50 million film production. Like This is a prime example of the absolute ineptitude and just ridiculousness that was going on in Hollywood at the time. And still goes on today where they think films like this are a good idea and they think that audiences are going to be attracted to absolute garbage like North. I don't know why they thought this was going to be a hit. But there's a reason why this studio was 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 in a little bit of trouble. Columbia Pictures. Like there's a reason why Columbia and New Line and Castle Rock like had some issues and ultimately got bought out by other studios because of decisions like North. But anyway, I don't know what else to say about North except thanks for watching my my review, my rant, and as always, I'll see you later. See ya.